Um, we have some really fantastic speakers joining us in this final panel. I'd like to invite Robbie Egan, who's the CEO of Book People, to join us. Sarah Kneebone, the Education Manager from Behaviour Works Australia, is coming back after our um, our last session together. Kate Larson is a writer and arts consultant who's been given the epic task of summarising <laughs> summarising today. I think you might have been given a few extra words, but uh, but it's an, it's going to be a seriously long haiku. Um, and um, <laughs> then we've got Anna as well. Hello, welcome everybody. Hi, Jess. Hi, Robbie. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi, everyone. Good to have you. Good to have you all here. So, whew, this is um this is really a, an epic task to try and summarise such a such a big day. Um, but what I might do is ask each of you. Uh, I might come around the circle and ask each of you for your reflection um, on what. Let's talk about that high level aspiration for a little while before we go on to the the how to. Robbie, can you give us a sense of what living in a reading nation would feel like um, from your perspective? Look, I hope I can. Uh, it's been 30 years of trying to help nudge us towards it. Um, based on the enormous amount of content today, I've luckily I've made a few notes. I think a reading nation is one where we accept reading as everything. Um, before we get into large language models that might create writerless books and you know, readerless books too. I think um, if you want to do anything in life, if you want to be in the television industry, if you want to be an actor, if you want to be a footballer or a baker, whatever you want to do, you're going to have to come to reading at some point and there's going to have to be engagement with the written word. And if you want to carve a niche, um, the better you read, the better you're going to do. Um, and the most important element of it is imagination and creativity. Um, I think not the creative economy type of imagination and creativity. I'm, I'm all mean. People who are going to charge our economy in the future are going to have to use design and creative thinking. And the way to stimulate imagination and creativity best is through reading. And I think we've established that today. And over time, um, what, I, what do I want this world to look like and what will it look like? I want my plumber to read The Economist and to quote from it when I speak with him. I want the baker to read the graphic novels of Robert Kirkman, The Walking Dead. I want Rick Rubin's book on creativity, creativity to be in the basement with the kid who's smoking bongs and playing loud electric guitar. I want reading to be absolutely normalised and it will be one day. And we want Indigenous communities and marginalised people, migrants, whoever they might be, to see themselves in those stories. Okay. I'm going to flip quickly and say a literate Australia is really another level of maturity. And lit literate to me isn't just about my life's been about book selling, bookshops and the physical book, but we need to be film literate, music literate, literate in the world of digital gaming, um, coding is writing after all. We need to be literate in reading landscape from an Indigenous perspective, but also from a mining perspective and from an agriculture perspective. I think reading Australia is a significantly better place and we'll all be richer for it economically uh, and culturally and socially. Now, I could go on, but I think we should pass this around a bit. But that's my starting, that's my opening monologue. <laughs> Thank you, Robbie. Um, I like that literacy is not just about books. Again, we're going back to the to Nadi um, at the very beginning of the day. That's um, really a great place to take us. Kate, Kate, what uh, would living in a reading nation look and feel like to you? Well, interestingly, um, in some ways we're already there. So more people we know engage in arts and culture on a weekly basis than they do in sport. And reading is the second most popular way that they do so. So second only to recorded music. Uh, we are already a nation um, of readers. Um, but we know that utopia of all we hope uh, out of being um, utopian idea of all we hope a reading nation could be that increased empathy, the increased um, social and personal skills um, have not come along with it yet. So for me, a Reading Nation is, and we've talked um, at various points today about 
um, what motivates us. Um, there's a lot of talk um, always around arts policy, around the comparison of funding between the arts and sport um, sectors, which is particularly interesting when um, only about half of Australians engage in sport um, every week, just under 50%, and we're right up at the 98% um, percent level on significantly less investment. So for me, one of the characteristics of a reading nation is um, the swapping of um, those priorities. So can you imagine what this amazing, complex, diverse sector um, that enables reading in so many different forms and formats could do if we were resource resourced on a similar level um, to an activity that less than half of us participate in right now. So that's my provocation and um, uh, own utopian dream. And I think that's what it would look like um, would be a state of abundance. Um, and hopefully alongside that, a loss of that stigma and the kind of snobbishness that Ben was talking about earlier about the different types of uh, genres, uh, formats, um, even the, the stigmas around the places that um, we read so that we could see more acceptance of the diversity of um, what um, reading and literacy look like in this brave new world. I love it, Kate. And so this state of abundance is a beautiful way of, of putting it, but also a shift in stigma, but a shift in identity um, from the way we perceive ourselves to what we are actually like. I mean, the fact that more people engage in arts and culture every week um, and, and in reading um, than might be participating in sport, for example, um, is not how we see ourselves or talk about ourselves as Australians. And that's one of the things I think that needs to change or we have the possibility to change. Sarah, your life is all, and your work is all about behavioural change. Um, and we've been lucky to have you join us earlier today and in this session. Can you tell us what would it feel like how would our behavior change and what would the what would tangibly feel like to live in a reading nation thanks so much jess and uh, hard hard um to come on the heels of uh, robbie and kate thanks so much for making it so difficult for me um <laughs> there's uh in terms of um behaviors i think one of the things with um reading and, and this has been talked about quite a number of times today is, is the social aspect of it you know we are social creatures we're, um we are evolved that way we like to be with others we watch others to see what is acceptable to see what is appropriate in any given situation. Um, we've had talks today about identity, about culture, uh, and the importance of those in driving our values um, and our self-perception. And all those things kind of tie in together with that, those social norms and uh, what is appropriate and what do we expect as a culture, as a group, um, as a nation, um, to it, it around these uh, reading behaviors. Now, one of the things that we find in the environmental space, which I think is uh, interesting for us to uh, look at, um, I've done a lot of work in the water and energy space, um, and we find that when there are behaviors that households are participating in that are visible, physically visible from the street, it encourages those behaviors in the community. So when people install solar powers on their roof, when they install water tanks, uh, when they put up signs saying, you know, these, this water is, uh, this garden is watered from the gray water system. When the community can see those behaviors going on, it shifts something. It shifts their own attitudes. It shifts their own beliefs and their own understanding about the importance and the role and significance of those behaviors and encourages further uh, engagement with those behaviors. Now, reading, you know, these conversations about where reading happens, where reading occurs, I think is really interesting. A lot of the time, it, to my mind, reading happens in quite a private space. You know, it happens at home, it happens in the evening, it happens in the living room, it happens in the bedroom. Um, we see commuters on public transport, you know, looking at their phones. We don't know what they're engaging with. Um, they could be watching a video. They could be reading. We're not sure. So even in public, it can, sometimes can be difficult to see whether it's a reading behavior that people are engaging in. And, and certainly when people are at home with their families, it, you know, it's impossible for the community, the general public, 
to see what is happening. It's a privately enacted behavior. So I think to me, is there any way of increasing that visibility of breeding as a behavior in order to leverage off the power of those social connections, those social norms, and to demonstrate how many people are doing this? Lots of people already have reading as a habit. Lots of people are reading on a daily basis. Lots of people um, are picking up books every day, but we can't see it happening because it happens in the private space. If we are able to shift some of that up, to me, a reading nation is one where that reading becomes more visible. So, you know, we are taking our books to the park. We're taking our books outside. We're taking our digital readers to the beach. Um, so, you know, maybe it's that, maybe it's something that can feed on itself. Can we demonstrate our own personal uh, commitment to reading, our own personal enjoyment of reading by making it more public, by taking it out into the public sphere and thereby reestablishing or, or, or establishing that social norm of reading as an enjoyable, as an important, as a um, productive and... Uh, 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 a growth type uh, behavior that is normal to engage with. And again, removing some of that stigma and judgment that Ben was talking about earlier, that whatever it is that you're engaged with, it's a-okay. I love that. I love that, you know, we'd, we'd all have uh, identify with a diverse spectrum of, of reading choices. You know, not everyone is going home and, and watching Werner Herzog on, on, you know, Netflix every night, right? Some of us are watching some real, well, let's say a balanced diet uh, of, <laughs> of audiovisual entertainment. Um, and it should be the same, I think, um, for, for your reading diet. Um, now, Anna, we've spoken about this before. And one of the things I loved about your response was the way that in a reading nation, reading would be one included in the kind of rituals and moments of our lives that we celebrate. Can you give us a little bit of a flavour yeah, of what like, that like might feel nice like? Thing. Yeah, well, I guess in, I love the Icelandic uh, example that lots of people use of the book flood. Um, so on Christmas Eve, you give a book. Um, and, and that's entirely normal and everybody does it and it can be any kind of book, any kind of format. And then you spend Christmas Eve when it's basically pitch black all day um, reading and then you talk about your books and then you kind of go to bed and wake up when it's Christmas. So, it, it, you know, that's a really that's a nice example of how reading is really visible to Sarah's point there. Um, it's really um, uh, valued. It's something that everyone can do in their own space. They're all, you know, you're not necessarily choosing because you're choosing for someone else. But, um, you, you know, there's still a sense of um, a joint activity as well. I think that's something that we can learn from sport is, is the way that there's that sense of everyone is in this together and it's really visible um, that I think has been highly successful for sport because sport as a sector, they don't tend to talk about their economic impact. They talk about emotions. They talk about me being part of a group and, and they make that really visible with team colours. So I think that there's there's plenty to kind of learn from, from, from that perspective. I think someone online was saying um, reading should be as normal as a pie at the footy. Um, so, so I think that there's definitely that way that we can, um, kind of in increase that visibility. And I think, um, the people have been using words online, like respect, I'm seeing coming up a lot as well, that, um, normalize, um, that it's, uh, so that real sense that it all comes down to that kind of sense of it's totally normal, super cool to talk about books in any kind of way, whatever way that people are comfortable with. So I feel like that's kind of what, what brings what what the vibe and flavor and emotion of a, a reading nation is for me and i love kate's provocation of saying we're already a reading nation i love that because we are but we want more and we've got to walk this like as an industry we're kind of walking this balance of um we're already doing really well we've got so much to build on but at the same time if we don't sustain that it could drop off a cliff um, and, and, and we must nurture and support this and we want more. We're ambitious. We want the whole country reading, not just 75% of it. So um, I think, but it's a, it's a great um, provocation, Kate, to not accept the premise of the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's what I would expect from this crew. And, you know, I think it goes back to something that Ben said as well is, you know, about starting from a strength-based rather than deficit-based mm. um, approach as well. You know, let's start from the presumption that we are a reading nation. Um, we're just not not very good at celebrating it because as Sarah says we tend to do it 
when we're cozied up under the under the doona or you know sitting by ourselves perhaps commuting or um, when when we're not in a social environment perhaps um, but actually we are a reading nation we just have to learn to celebrate it a little bit more and perhaps make it more visible in our national identity we have got an extraordinary depth of responses uh, on now if you're looking for this on Slido go to the polls section you'll have to input a little bit um, your own comment in order to see all of the responses from everyone else but there are some phenomenal responses in there um, and some and they range from the kind of experiential to the tangible um, and how we get there so we will dive into lots of those uh, but I want to um, uh, to ask a, a question of of the, uh, the panel about how we measure that success. Um, because we've talked now about what it would feel like um, and we, we know that we're going to have to walk a path to get there and do some work to get there. But do we also need to change what we measure as a sector uh, in order to achieve those outcomes? We have to perhaps stop counting. Let's say, I know book sales are important, um, but um, one of the excellent comments in the in the chat is that wouldn't it be great to see young people or people of all ages you know swapping books more and seeing books more as something that you share and trade and and um, circulate um, rather than something you stockpile and and keep to yourself um, and if we're measuring engagement and impact maybe we're not measuring sales necessarily we're, but, or, or in isolation, we're measuring engagement in different ways. Does anyone have any um, ideas or comments or insights? I mean, Sarah, perhaps I'll start with you because this is measuring behaviour change is a hard thing to do, right? Um, what have you, what can you share with us about that? Thanks, Jess. Um, well, you know, and bread, bread and butter question uh, <laughs> for us. And it's the kind of thing that uh, uh, myself and my colleagues get very excited about because we love if, we, if we're creating change, we need to be able to measure it, right? You can't just throw a program out and um, and, and expect it to work because, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately things tend to happen and, um, you know, the implementation may be off or something else can happen and there may be unforeseen um, uh, outcomes, uh, unforeseen circumstances that, that have messed with it. So measurement is incredibly important. You know, measurement allows us to, you know, demonstrate to our funders that what we're doing works it allows us to demonstrate to ourselves that it works it allows us to make sure that what we're doing is is right it's going in the right direction it prevents us from making those assumptions so I, th I think you're absolutely right that measurement is incredibly important when it comes down to what you measure that very much depends on you know what is that behavior that you are trying to um, that you are trying to create? What is it that you are trying to change? Um, uh, we talked about earlier, you know, reading is a catch-all term for hundreds of behaviors that, that come underneath that because each different audience, each different location, each different time of engaging with material, each different kinds of material is a different behavior. So if we want to increase the number of teenagers who are reading graphic novels at home in the evening, that is one behavior and we would be looking to measure that. Have we seen an increase in that through our programs, through our campaigns, through our increased accessibility of that audience to that material? Um, so it's that's why we get very down to the nitty gritty. We get very, very specific. What is it exactly, what change exactly is it that we are trying to create? Who do we want to do what? where and when and it's always about that question and then in terms of measurement we have loads of different tools at our, our disposal you know we're research scientists we use surveys we use questionnaires we use self-report um, we look at um, social media outputs we look at all sorts of different forms of data that will give us an indication as to whether that change is occurring or not. We look at the change itself. So we would look at, you know, how many more teens are engaging with these graphic novels at home in their bedroom. But we could also look at the drivers and barriers. So we could also say, you know, if we identified the barrier was lack of access, have we managed to increase the access to this material? And that also is a legitimate measure, how we increase the access. Have we shifted attitudes towards this type of material? Have we uh, 
you know, reduce the cost? You know, have we changed the barrier to, to getting hold of that material? Have we enabled the libraries to be open longer in the schools? You know, so what is the change that we're trying to make that we are assuming if we make that change, it will lead to the behavior that um, we are aiming for. So there are lots of ways to do it. There are lots of different tools and techniques we can use um, to do that. Uh, but things like engaging with your audience through things like surveys, questionnaires, many of the, many of the audience here is very familiar with these um, uh, processes. Um, it's very legitimate, it's a very legitimate way of assessing whether that change has taken place. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Kate, uh, Robbie, uh, do um, Anna, do you have any thoughts to share on what we might add add to our list of, of measurements and KPIs? Anna, did you want to jump I, in? No, let, let's oh, sorry. go. I've had plenty of chance Kate, to speak today. Kate. <laughs> mm. um, I just wanted to say that I completely agree with Sarah. So part of it is about expanding our definition of what reading and literacy can be and removing that those old-fashioned notions of of trying to apply um, historical definitions of what they, they've meant in the past. Um, but I'd also love to see a change in how we measure uh, value in terms of the value we infer upon our writers who are not paid anywhere near on a level that's in keeping with the popularity of their work, even though making a book takes the longest time um, of nearly all outcomes, um, writers are more likely to invest in education um, uh, and, you know, humanities degrees aren't cheap anymore. Um, so the, the inv initial investment on, in, in time and education on behalf of writers is disproportionately high um, to, at best, we can um, aim for an average of $18,000 a year income from our works. That's 18, one, eight, not eight, zero. Um, <laughs> poets, of which I am one, can, can aim for, uh, expect up to $6,000 a year from our creative work. So I'd really love to see in our abundant reading culture um, a measurement on how writers are valued in the creation of the work um, that we're all reading. Really great point, uh Kate, you know, about how we value value the things we say we value, you know, how, how we reward the things we say we value. Um, thank and, you. And it's Robbie, that was, sorry, sorry, it was Anna. implicit in some, but not explicit in some of our, our kind of the earlier conversations was that um, just as access to books and autonomy of choice around books are important ingredients in the recipe for reading, um, access to an author is transformative. Um, and that authors need to be respected and rewarded for, for that influence and, and support that they have. Like, um, it, so meeting an author for the first time really can completely change someone's life. So that, that's, that's an important aspect to, to a reading nation. So Thanks. access, uh, what was it? Remove the stigma and make it easy, make it easy, make it easy. <laughs> um, Sarah, were you talking about nudges earlier and uh, Richard Thaler? I think it was you. Anyway, behavioural economics and the way we nudge people towards behavioural change is really key in this. And the big nudge, I think, has to come from government. And then you have to measure whether the nudge does anything. Um, I'd hate to think we get away from broad measurements like sales. When you cut sales down into genre, demographics, uh, where the sales are made and what might have impacted them in the background, that flows directly into author income. So we, you can't say that they don't work. They're just they're the first thing you probably glance at and then you try to slice and dice. So they're, they're really important metrics, particularly at my end of the, the industry, which is the, the last point of the value chain, which is trying to get the money out of the consumer, the reader, to give it to the author ultimately. So don't give up on sales data yet. <laughs> Look, and I think it's a, also a really interesting uh, and, and critical uh, access point for a lot of people. One of the comments that um, really resonates with me from Luna so in the chat is about um, one of the things we'd see in a reading nation would be bookstores and big department stores um, stocking books in languages other than English to um, improve access to, to reading material. Um, and for libraries to be in every school as well. So um, the 
access, broader access to more material that more people can engage with, um, uh, you know, and not a monocultural approach, but a multicultural approach to the reading material that we have access to is such a critical point. I mean, the, the chat is going off. So here's a few of my highlights, and I'd love to hear a few of your highlights and mm. bring them into yeah. Discussion. Some of my highlights are um, to the point about ritual um, from earlier that, that Anna was talking about earlier. I had no idea that February 14 is book giving day. St. Valentine has gotten way too good a rap for too long. It's time for us to um, give it back to the books. Um, and March 19 is read to me day. So there are some opportunities for us to uh, attach, to, you know, some more uh, ritual and and uh, momentous moments maybe to to the practice of reading and sharing books and giving books. Um, there are also there's also been a bit of a thread in uh, in the chat about the need to increase third spaces um, mm. to uh, you know um, like the pub um, that that Shay was talking about, but other places where we can engage in reading in those more public and visible ways um, that we're that we've been talking about. Um, and two other points that really jump out to me, uh, so there's a comment in there about in schools having equal time, spending equal time on the enjoyment of reading and not just the mechanics of reading. Um, so how can we spend time in schools or in other, um, in other ways that we come together, not just learning to read mechanically, but learning how to make choices about books, how to um, connect with identity through books um, and how to express ourselves in that way. Um, and the final thought I'll share um, that I loved from the, um, the chat so far, but really there are so many responses coming through. Hmm. This point about removing stigma from different sorts of different kind of genres and different um, types of reading or different types of receiving and, and sharing stories I think is a really critical one and I loved that parallel with sports teams and you know you know maybe maybe one day I can wear a pin that um, that speaks to my love of non-fiction and another day I can wear you know a scarf or, or something that um, that connects with other people who read graphic novels or you know how can we find our tribes and align our identities um, through uh, the, the things that we love to read and share and create moments of connection. Um, I think there's something really fun in all of that too. So those are some of the ideas that are coming through on the Slido chat uh, for me that, that I really love. Uh, Anna, are there any that have jumped out at you? Jess, you're doing too good a job of managing to chair panels and also summarise all of these beautiful comments. Uh, so, so I think you, you've hit on, on a lot of it, that kind of third space people are talking about books on public transport, giving books to others, leaving notes in books so that people can see someone else has read it and enjoyed it and passed it on. So there's that sense of someone else has been here before. The book isn't an object in isolation. Um, so that, that that's kind of a really interesting point. There, there's quite a lot of uh, along the theory, uh, along the lines of um, but but how how do I help someone choose a book? How do I help someone find a book? How do I help someone who's already the, maybe themselves doesn't believe that strongly in reading um, help their family or their children to, to find books? And I think that's something where I think it's really important for us to point out that there are more than 30,000 of us and 87% plus of this country truly believe in the power of reading. That's why this conference is called Volume. We need to turn up the volume on, on what's happening um, here that we do believe in this and we can help one another. And there's been a real theme, to, lovely theme today about like taking the pressure off ourselves and sharing the load, like, like growing literacy as a shared cultural responsibility as a country and, and engaging with reading. So that's really, that's a nice, a nice theme to see that, that, that how do we take the, how can we be champions and keep the energy that Lizzie was talking about earlier that we need, um, but also learn from one another. So book recommendations, booksellers, librarians, publishers, stuffed with them. They know the topic so well. They know the whole genre. They know whatever, everything in that category. Have a conversation with them. They'll give you something beautiful um, or 10 beautiful things probably. And so I think that that's how we kind of work better together within our different bits of the discipline is really something for us to, to think about how we manage that. I know it's really hard within our isolation and constraints, but how might we do that really well, really effectively share our own existing knowledge? 
And someone, uh, there was a great point earlier from Emma that really struck uh, me was, where everybody here today is a reader. Where are the non-readers? Wouldn't it be great to hear from a non-reader? And that is such a valid point that is pinging little light bulbs in my head. Why, why didn't we think? Um, and that's a question for us, maybe all in our daily lives. Maybe we go and have a conversation with someone who doesn't read and just have a bit of a conversation to understand what it doesn't do for them and why they don't. Well, I think there's a, a, a really interesting thread here about access and participation um, that is also um, starting to, to bubble up in, in the conversation um, because uh, when we have this discussion about time and we've heard the word, you know, the, the point come up that people don't have time, um, one of the kind of key symptoms of disadvantage is people um, being time poor you know, not having the time to um, sit down with their kids, you know, being on a long commute, not having the, the time um, with with kids after school, for example, or time with, with elders or, or people in their family to sit down and read or to engage in social activities because people are working so hard um, just to make ends meet. Um, and then, of course, access to books. Um, uh, yes, someone made the point, and my heart also soars whenever I see a street library. It's a wonderful thing. Um, but then I've also had conversations with people uh, in my own family who've never seen a street library. And so there's an element of privilege there where in my neighbourhood I can't I can't dodge a street library because there's so many of them. Um, but in other neighbourhoods, they're perhaps not as visible. Um, and so I think there's a conversation about who is lacking access and how can we support them um, to increase access. Um, well, and we just had a, a related a related comment in Jess from one of the threads from, um, uh, thank you to Stuart for pointing out that what are the risks if we don't do this? Um, mm. Because at, at the beginning of today, I talked about some, some you know, trends that are kind of hovering around, around a drop in reading participation and engagement. And that's really why we're here. Yes, we're a reading nation, but there are some worrying trends and there is a, there are very real risks um, if we cannot manage to build a reading nation. So I think that that, that, that is still kind of rumbling along in the background. Um, we're full of fantastic ideas. These are beautiful ideas that we yeah. have. Um, so many that are out there. We amazing have so much creativity in the community, but we've got to scale some of these up. We've got to get investment. We've got to be heard in other spaces so that we can mitigate that danger that is kind of lurking. Okay, so I think um, we we need to flag this point around privilege and access and, and um, who is missing out, who's not in this conversation and who doesn't um, see themselves as readers. I think Lily's also made a really important point in the Q&A um, about, um, uh, sorry, in the ideas section um, about the transition for young people, men especially, um, to, to from, from reading as a kid, teenager, to reading as an adult because of the difficulty in finding access to stories um, that resonate with them, um, an overemphasis on serious fiction. Again, the kind of stigma around what is real reading and what is not. Um, and, and again, recommendation and access. So those are some really important points that have come through. Um, so back, uh, you know, the, there was that great point earlier about accessibility in some of the perhaps more, um, you know, uh, dis, you know what, what, what's referred to as the discount um, sellers or, or more accessible sellers. That's one way that we can give people more access. Bringing the book club into the pub is another great example of giving access. Um, can I throw to our panel and, and, and ask, uh, does anything jump out at you that you see as helping move us from, from where we are to, to where we want to be? Um, so, um, look, okay. I, I see uh, as, um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, let's go with Robbie and then we'll come to you, Kate. <laughs> look, uh, I'll be brief. It seems to me it's kind of like it's an attitudinal thing that reading is still a little bit like Brussels sprouts. And so my job is to make bookshops and books and reading cool. We don't need to... They already are cool, but it's a trick of the light. So I have to manipulate physical environments like libraries, bookshops, to trick people into believing that these are things that you want to be involved in. The other thing was you talked about seeing people reading, take them to a library or bookshop, and you'll see 23 people all reading, all in the same space. So that's a pretty simple solution there. 
I just think, yeah, we need to move the conversation away from the health, literacy, better outcomes, even though that's all true, and somehow talk more about what you like to do. And if what you like to do is represented in books, and it's going to be because everything is there, um, you'll find your place. I, I couldn't think agree that's more. a really critical one. It's like from the shoulds to the you wants. Go, go for it, Kate. I was just going to say I, I feel exactly the same way because I think some of the work we need to do is internal. Some of this uh, stigma has been internalised. Uh, so on an individual level, I think we all need to do a little bit of work about removing the guilty from our guilty pleasures um, and just talk about it as, as, pl as pleasure, as pleasure being um, a perfectly valid outcome um, or reason to read, um, just as important, uh, especially in these challenging times entertainment distraction pleasure prioritizing those things are, are radical acts of protest and self-care um as is celebrating and, and i think we get there by celebrating reading in all the genres we've talked about today so that fanfic and social media poetry are seen as valid and um relevant as printed non or literary fiction in all formats so moving away from the still perpetual argument that audiobooks aren't reading ridiculousness um, uh, or uh, as somebody said earlier moving away from that idea of digital devices being something that we do when that stops us reading to something that enables reading or uh, that is actual actual real reading time in and of itself love that Sarah um, I yeah, just coming back to something that that Anna mentioned, and in fact, and Robbie actually, and Lily mentioned as well, in in, in the comments was about this uh, this idea of choice. You know, there is everything out there. There is books on every subject under the sun. There is we there is incredible choice. There is the paradox of choice. So, um, uh, researcher Barry Swartz has talked a lot about the, the paradox of choice and the fact that you know when we provide consumers with um, uh, 20 different types of jam, what tends to happen is they walk away without buying any jam. If we provide them with three types of jam, they will buy a pot of jam. Um, uh, you know, Aldi has built its entire sort of marketing strategy around it with the, the adverts about the person walking down the pasta sauce aisle and they gradually turn older and decay because there's so many different types of pasta sauce and they're like, it's okay, come to Aldi, we only have three types of pasta sauce. Um, so, you know, books, they're just incredible. These, you know, this dream of the, the library of Alexandria, you know, that's the kind of thing that makes us really, really excited. But we're like, we're in it, right? We are not our target audience. We're like, we love that. But it, that can be really intimidating and really scary. And from a psychological perspective, wh when we're presented with too much choice, we, we shut down. So rather than making a random choice, we make no choice. So it's, it precludes the behavior altogether. It stops it. Um, now, Netflix found this. When they first started their, their screening, streaming service, they had the Netflix start page. You may remember in the days of yore, um, that the Netflix first page was just like loads of, you had to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. And they had no categories. They just had pictures and they had hundreds of pictures and thousands of pictures of all these different programs that were on offer on Netflix. As the years have gone by, they have got more and more sophisticated using their algorithms. So now you are presented the very first line, the very first thing that you see is things that are 98% compatible with things that you have seen before. Things that they already know that you like, things that they already know turn you on, things that they already know that you're going to watch. And all the other stuff, you don't, you don't even see it. And, you know, so it creates this, it has pros and cons, right? It creates this tunnel vision effect. It traps us in our little boxes. But at the same time, it means that they've got you and they've hooked you and they know that what you're going to watch next. I don't know. Do we have something like that for books? I mean, you know, those algorithms can get very, very sophisticated. And for some of our audiences, that choice paradox, it, you know, as I say, it can cause paralysis. Is there anything that we can do? Anna, your idea of, you know, talk to these incredible resources, amazing people, the booksellers, the librarians. What a fantastic and incredible resource. Um, but if you're not in that space and you're not with those people, what do you do? Or, or how do we find ways so to bring there. out that? How do we find ways to bring out that knowledge in other ways and translate it for those different audiences, Sarah? I think that's a really interesting question for us as a reading sector. 
Mm. I love this idea that you've raised um, about overcoming the paradox of choice, perhaps through curation and recommendation from trusted sources. Um, so if we're talking about a multiplicity of audiences and people hearing recommendations that are aligned for them, how can we have those kind of influencer trusted sources, people that um, you can identify with who are making recommendations that are aligned with you in easy, accessible ways um, that uh, that cut through uh mm. so you're not because you know, when you see someone else's netflix it looks really weird i have to say it doesn't look anything like my netflix um but um <laughs> but that's that's a, an incredible amount of work that's gone into that um there was a wonderful uh a suggestion um from in the ideas from sandeep um and this is a great aspiration i love this by the way they have you have a grand final holiday in Victoria coming up um, could we start a reading day holiday movement and imagine if on reading day um, it wasn't just read anything but there were people like you you know like people that you um, maybe you make your five book recommendations and people who um, are friends of yours and who who know you can see if there's anything that resonates with them and then there's people that you might follow on social media um, who um, you identify with who might make recommendations that um, uh, that that you resonate with you so we each start to become like those booksellers but in our own in our own categories in our own worlds and, and spheres of influence um, there are some really phenomenal more and more um, ideas coming through. Um, the idea of seeing more book creatives in the media, so hearing more of the voices of storytellers um, coming forward in media as well is another big recommendation that we're seeing. Um, and on a structural level, the idea of school libraries being mandatory throughout Australia and its territories and that library studies and teacher librarian funding that's comparable to other curricula is another structural recommendation that we're seeing. So um, as you can see in our comments, we're getting both streams, both the kind of individual behaviour influence and the structural change. And are there any other ideas that are, are jumping out for you? Oh, oh, there's plenty that, that's um, coming through. I'm getting distracted by wanting to chat to you all in the particular threads uh, rather than doing it in the in this forum. I, I think um, I think really thinking about priority is something that's come up for me. I think we've got an advantage in that. Actually, there are so many of us, and there are organisations who are doing fantastic work. How can we we support one another to kind of focus on particular areas or particular audiences, perhaps, um, and make sure that they've we're amplifying the work of others and supporting what they're doing. Um, maybe we have too many days, for example. I mean, I, I'd love a public holiday for reading, absolutely, for sure. Um, but but maybe the kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of number of days that pop up, are there too many? Um, have we got the right flow through the year of how all of them sit? Um, so these are kind of questions that come up. But then priority really says to me, we've got lots we could do. There's so many amazing creative ideas. And we do have across all of us and all our organizations lots of potential that we can tap into um, but how might we focus on just a few audiences and I think someone asked about where did Scottish Book Trust get their funding earlier they were really smart they focused on their live literature program and their early years program because they knew they could get money and funding for early years because it was an easier message to sell than some other messages um, and so they grew the book bug program and off the success of that People came to them and wanted to invest. So they were able to create new programs. So I think really thinking um, smartly about how do we start? What couple of audiences, what couple of programs do we put our resources in? So we don't spread ourselves so thin that we all end up going, yay, books. And we're not actually having the time and the energy to do the targeted work. And I think, Sarah, this kind of, to me, your, your work really resonates around um, how do we really think about our audiences? How do we really focus how do we understand their motivations and then how do we tailor to them? And we need we need the space to do that work. So I think I think that real because there's so many beautiful ideas coming through and so many just um, really gorgeous thoughts about curators in the general um, in the general community, really thinking about um, people sharing tips on Storygraph, for example. I can see that um, Catherine Gledhill Tucker, one of our earlier speakers, is here with us. Um, so how do we help one another curate? What tools can we use? Um, th there's all that knowledge out there. So I think there's another theme there once again about how we share that knowledge. 
Mm. And there's um, a great comment in there, uh, just one second, Robbie, about um, um, from Kirsty Murray uh, about introducing reading curators into the general community. Librarians and booksellers and passionate readers need to be everywhere. How do we get those types of people onto public transport and into every public forum? Um, and Kate's made the really good, Kate Larson's made the great point that this is happening on BookTok and Instagram. So, sorry, Bookstagram, I should say. Um, so, uh, but that is probably privileging a younger cohort. So how do we support, and again, you know, we want to make sure older readers are not being left out of the conversation. How can we bring that into um, some offline context as well? Uh, please go ahead, Robbie. I just wanted to say uh, as the somehow eternal optimist, I think we can also cut ourselves a bit of slack and I, I've spent my entire life in the book industry. One of my kids reads constantly, is 27, has read about a billion books. The other child will not read, does not read, could not care less. You can't have a one-size-fits-all, and I'm not saying anyone said that, but it's some people don't want to read is the other point I wanted to make. They absorb differently. I guess that speaks to, to Mark's point a little bit, Robbie, uh, where, you know, we, we maybe won't get the people who are entrenched in their view, but there are plenty of per the persuadables. And maybe that's that's what we think about when we think about priorities. <laughs> and maybe there are different ways of receiving stories than reading books um, oh, yeah. that we can, um, that we can start to bring into the fold as well. Now, we're coming down to the end of our day. Somehow, this is all just flown by so quickly um, and I know you've all been um, paying attention today and listening into lots of the conversations. I might come to each of you now um, and ask for your reflections on um, where to from here um, and if there's one and Anna made the very good point about how there's no shortage of ideas, there's just a shortage of um, time and resources um, and so if we had to prioritise one of the actions that we've heard about today, um, what would what would your recommendation be? Uh, I might start with you, Kate, then Sarah, and then Robbie. Oh, that's such a, a such an impossible question. Uh, to <laughs> You've got to write the summary, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, speaking of speaking of impossible things to do. Um, uh, look, there's been so much wisdom coming out of the the whole conference um, speakers, but also the wisdom in the digital room today that I couldn't yet um, narrow that down. But I just wanted to touch on something that we hadn't talked about uh, yet, which is I think the, the that we often learn more from bad examples and bad situations. And I think it is really vital right in this moment um, uh, to take note of the regressive and regressive and very dangerous trends affecting readers right now. So from the book bans and the new laws fining teachers and librarians for sharing books in the US um, or locally to the now regular protests outside libraries um, against drag queen story times. Um, as always, as we're seeing um, with the uh, the toxic debates around the um, referendum, those calling for silencing or censorship um, uh, seem concerned about the impact on their comfort ideology or quality of life, while those of us um, that silencing affects are concerned about actual lives, which we know that books can save. I think this is a really important moment for us all to be advocates for um, all of these books being out in the world. Oh, Kate, that's a really critical point. I mean, this is all happening at a time um, when um, comfort versus, you know, inclusion and freedom and identity um, are uh, somehow being equated, um, you know, and they this, these things happen in one part of the world, but they can have a really toxic influence in, on the public discourse in other parts of the world too. So that's a really critical point. Um, and so I suppose what the takeaway from what, for me, from what you've said, is about pluralism and multiplicity, and um, and how the, the power of reading to expand uh, our, our grasp of the world and our, you know, uh, that that the world is about more than being comfortable. Um, it's about 
you know, uh, understanding each other. So, so thank you. That's a, a really wonderful point. Sarah, please. Thanks, Jess. Um, I, you know, the, the, we've heard from some, you know, just really incredible speakers today. And I um, find myself very honoured to have been part of this. And I've just, and as I say, I've learned so, uh, learned so much from uh, everybody who's been um, participating. Um, I, you know, I, to me, I think the idea of getting a bit of focus, um, you know, as Robbie was saying, you know, we can be be proud of of what we have achieved and what, where we have managed to get to and, and where we are um and as kate says you know we we are you know to in many perspectives a nation of readers um and that's you know new due in no small part to the the, the passion that people here have um conveyed um and, and shared and enabled and empowered others to also engage with this uh, wonderfully enriching um, uh, pastime, and um, you know, and from there, you know, we so from that sort of sense of sort of celebration and acknowledgement and congratulations, it's also you know that question that we have been asking this afternoon: where to from here? Where are the gaps? Where are the gaps that we would like to fill? And getting a little bit of focus, so getting a little bit of clarity about you know who who is it. Who is it who is missing? Who is it that we are not hearing from? Who is it that we're not including? Who is it who's missing from the table? Um, and then, you know, what are the behaviors that we would like to support these people with um, and, and gain some clarity around that? And then understanding, you know, where is that, uh, uh, where is that gap happening? How is that gap happening? Uh, and how we can address it and, and getting a little bit of a sense of almost a, a prioritization process to try and identify where we can with our limited resources acknowledging our limited resources we have we have to we have to start picking we have to start prioritizing we have to start um, focusing um, and uh, putting our resources somewhere where they're going to make that impact that we are looking for that we're trying to create um, in order to continue the momentum that the whole um, the whole area already has. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Robbie, and then I'll come to you, Anna, to, to conclude. Okay. Well, the eternal optimist is probably going to um, sound a note of caution. Um, I love technology. I'm a huge science fiction reader. That's where I spend my time, and I'm about to embark on research into it specifically. The technologies that are bringing us interesting formats such as audio on demand and ebooks are really dominated by a few players. And capitalism is very good at channeling funds in new industries into one or two players. It tends towards the monopoly. And we have to be very careful to make sure that we put in place things that democratize those formats, or we end up with the tail wagging the dog and we will have writers being told what to write and publishers being told what to publish by significant entities. That's a cautionary note. Um, I'm very optimistic, however, that we will manage to do that. So thanks very much for having us today. This has been really brilliant, by the way. Thank you, Robbie. I totally agree. Uh, Anna, tell us, um, how would you wrap this up? Um, well, I don't want to wrap it up, I think, is the question. Uh, this, you know, this is a conversation that's been going for 30, 40, 50 years, um, but this is volume one. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really interested in how we can keep the conversation going. Um, and, and I am really interested in those next steps and how we take things forward. Like all of that, Kate, you just said it's wisdom in the digital room there. There is so much wisdom and expertise in the digital room. How do we harness it? So um, please, I know you're probably all signed up to the Australia Reads newsletter. Letter. Kate's beautiful summary, once we've given her enough headspace to think about how we put this day together, will come in the future through that channel. Um, and we'll be thinking about what do we do next? What can Australia Reads role play as a collaboration between libraries, authors, booksellers and publishers? Um, what, where to from here? What kind of programs could look like? And, and what kind of support might, might others need? And how do we amplify one another? So those are all questions for me, but really sign up, sign up to the newsletter and send us your thoughts. So if you do have reflections, if there are things you're really keen to see, hello at australiareads.com.au. You can get in touch with us directly. 
I should have known you're working on a sequel. Classic. Classic. Well, book. not not officially. I'm just gonna say not officially. It all depends on, you know, this this is what we had the funding for for one off. Um, but but what do people want? What do people need? What's what what is missing? <laughs> so I just need to put that qualifier out there, Jeff. Uh, no, no, of course, of course. Serious ambitions, uh, but right now it's just volume one. <laughs> I hope you're watching Creative Australia. So um no, it, just just kidding. Thank you so much, Anna, Robbie, Kate, and Sarah.